This episode of Grammar Geezers is a little bit different. It's not about comma rules or when to use who or whom or the importance of stylistic variation. Rather, it's a short film about John's office, how he came to occupy it, why he had to leave it years before he wanted to, and where it is now. This is John Rubido on the cover of the book I wrote about him. This was John's office. John Rubido was a teacher. He was a very good teacher. In 2005, John received the Golden Apple Award as the best teacher at the University of Michigan as voted by students. He gave a lecture on the occasion. He told jokes, he digressed. Here's an example. Okay, uh, so, so anyway, uh, my purpose is, and my audience Tonight is not the professor, and it's not the administration, it's not the staff, it's not the commons people. My audience is or are my students. It's a collective noun, I can use either one. All right? So, so it is or are my students. And I'm going to say this and you'll never read it, so nobody gets upset. Uh, my audience is or are my students, and I show employ language suitable and appropriate to that audience. Let me say it again. My audience is or are my students, and I show uh, employ language suitable and appropriate to that audience. Okay, anybody got any questions? No. Okay. Because I don't want to ask to answer questions. Because one time I was given a speech, I hate giving speeches, okay, but I'm up here because I want a thousand bucks. But I'm this is the God's honest truth, okay? I hate giving speeches, and so I was given a speech to this uh, Royal Blue or Amazing Blue people, you know, the kids that get four point two averages, they want to bring them to Michigan. Why they asked me, I have no idea. But anyway, I said afterwards that uh, it was I thought it was a horrible speech, but they liked it, but they didn't say anything bad because they were in high school. But anyway, uh, I said this kid, I said, any questions? I was thinking they're asking me some really great questions. But this kid said, uh, is that your real beard? <laughs> and I said, No, son, my real beard is in my pocket. <laughs> He had Jeremy Kittle, an award-winning fiddler and former student, play some tunes. Fiddlers don't typically participate in teaching award acceptance speeches. John taught writing. He taught me in 1989. He taught discursively, darting off on tangents, telling stories, telling jokes. He swore a lot. His class was about more than writing. It was about life and how to live it. About, as he put it, quote, the human condition. Quid pro quo, scratch your itch, he said. Quid pro quo meaning you get out of life what you put into it. Scratch your itch meaning follow your passions because they lead you to where you should be. Carpe diem, carpe rosum. Seize the day, gather the flowers before they wilt. He'd been at Michigan for less than two years when I met him. Before that, he taught at Purdue. Before that, he'd done a Fulbright in Romania. Before that, he'd been at Lincoln Memorial University in Tennessee, a state Abraham Lincoln never set foot in. He'd gotten his PhD at Georgia State University when he was 35. That's pretty old for an English PhD. John was pretty old because he'd already lived a lot. He'd survived a childhood in poverty driven by an alcoholic father, attended the University of Wisconsin in his hometown of Madison, and then taken a job with the American Red Cross to see the world. This is during the Vietnam War, but he was fortunate to land in Germany where he tricked out an old VW bus and drove all over Europe with his wife Barbara and daughter Becky. They had a son there, Nick. But. Not long after they returned to Wisconsin, Barbara committed suicide. John didn't know what to do. He ended up fleeing all the way to Hamburg, Germany. His sister Joan took care of Becky and Nick. It was only after a year overseas working for an American Express travel agency that John returned to his kids and moved to Atlanta to live near his best friend. Atlanta is where Georgia State is. He envisioned getting a master's degree in English and returning to teach in Germany with the kids. He ended up with a PhD in English and teaching in Tennessee. Life's like that sometimes. So that's the backstory. But this is about John's office at the University of Michigan. 
John's office started out looking like a standard academic office. Students started sending him postcards, which he pinned to a cork bulletin board on his office door. It didn't take long for the board to fill up. The postcards kept coming. He might have started coding his office with postcards, but in 1987, a student, Lillian Matsumoto, took a picture of John's class and gave John a print. He pinned it to the cork bulletin board. Over the next couple of semesters, other class photos joined it. Then came photos from the dozens of graduation parties that John attended each year. Despite having never sought tenure, if you combine his towering height and long gray beard with a cap and gown, you had a Dumbledore professorial look, and for so many years he led a graduation procession on stage. John kept the cap and gown on for the parties, which explains his attire in a lot of the photos. These photos displaced the postcards, filled the bulletin board, and radiated onto a nearby wall. As John moved offices more than once in his early years on campus, resettling the photos became a burden. His wife, Pat, came up with the idea of gluing the growing hordes of faces to two foot by three foot foam core boards, then mounting the boards using those tiny clear plastic screw-in mirror clips. Pat did almost all the photo gluing work. This might be considered below her pay grade as a Slavic's PhD and fellow University of Michigan English instructor. But thanks to that work, office moves then became a matter of removing the boards and hanging them in the next space. Finally, John settled into a third floor office in Angel Hall. Throughout the 1990s, 2000s, and 2010s, photos spread across its walls, ceiling, and windows. And with each new class, each graduation party, each visit from former students, now often with kids in tow, the photos stacked up. When every surface of the place was covered, including his office window, which looked out onto a brick wall, Pat and a former student fashioned mobiles that hung from the ceiling. With time, the mobiles filled the higher reaches of John's office. This was a walk-in photo album, an explosion of the students John was so fond of. But in 2017, John, by then 78 years old, found himself facing sexual harassment allegations, not from students, but from fellow faculty. This was at the height of the Me Too movement. The story made the front page of the student newspaper, the Michigan Daily. Of course, sexual harassment and impropriety was and remains a problem at Michigan and elsewhere. But in John's case, the accusations weren't fair. Among them included his nicknaming a secretary named Huff Huffy, confusing the names of two Indian women and offering dog biscuits to a colleague who, like John, had a dog. This colleague, a tenured professor, was technically John's superior. She told investigators from the University of Michigan's Office for Institutional Equity that she viewed John's persistent dog biscuit gifting as a, quote, weird sexist power trip. She added this, as a former director of undergraduate studies, as a tenured professor, and as a woman, I seem to irritate or provoke him, handing off this biscuit to me as if I'm his own pet in need of his reward, bizarrely expresses and placates his own issues with women and perhaps with women in authority. Another witness, a fellow lecturer, accused him of trying to look down her shirt. John, being about six foot five, looked down at about everybody on campus who wasn't on the basketball team. The same colleague described the walk-in photo gallery of John's office as, quote, very weird. Despite the Office for Institutional Equity concluding that John's behavior didn't merit dismissal, David Porter, a Michigan English professor serving as department chair at the time, decided to fire John anyway. That happened on August 3rd, 2018. A few days later, the Michigan Daily published a second article about John. It relied almost entirely on a single, quote, former graduate student who more or less just attacked John. About John's office, it went like this. The graduate student explained the overwhelming number of pictures of former students on Rubido's office walls could be construed as disturbing. Then it quoted this anonymous graduate student. Personally, I would find it strange to do that, he said. I ask permission before I take photos of my students, and just the large quantity of photos makes it strange. But again, depending on your perspective, it can either be endearing or creepy. This all went down in the summer before the 2018 school year started. The timing was deliberate on the administration's part, most students had yet to return to campus, so all the fewer to protest John's firing. Still, dozens of former students wrote letters to the administration asking that John be reinstated. 
Many were addressed to the University of Michigan's president, Mark Schlissel. Besides form letter responses from a university spokesman, Schlissel never addressed the issue. He was, it seems, otherwise occupied. Same story with Provost Martin Filbert. He was also in the chain of command. So after 31 years as one of the University of Michigan's top rated and most popular teachers, John was gone. But what to do with his office? The photos had to come down. And they did come down with help from Elise Yu, a former student of John's and her husband, Carl, who helped out too. They unscrewed the mirror hangers and took down the mobiles and brought it all back to their Ann Arbor home. 22 photo paddle wheels and dozens of foam core boards and all. The office wasn't quite the same afterward. Down in Elise and Carl's basement, there was plenty of room on the carpet and in the closets. But Elise and Carl were in their early 30s. And while their only dependent at the time was a labradoodle named Masubi that John had coaxed them into buying, this sure looked like a great space for a child's play area. And indeed, by the summer of 2021, a daughter was on the way. I took a trip back to Ann Arbor with some LED lights, a Nikon DSLR, and a tripod. The goal was to take photos of the photos. This is the beginning of the project. Sorry. Yeah, I can look at it. Just check, only because I think I feel like I took pictures of stuff in there, but oh, you, yeah. you could easily have moved stuff in the last, last two years. Those are the flat ones. There's more than 40 of those, pal. John, 40 is a vicious undercount. We're going to be here for seven hours. It was chaotic at times really not good but we got to get it done it's 306 eastern we've got these fabulous assistants they're really into the project you can tell thanks so much the process took hours john got tired these first there were 18 times four this is the last of the sort of normal size john's um john's a little tired <laughs> Oh shit, you can't believe it. Seriously, this is fucking throw with you. I just, I, I love you. What are you doing? I've just been standing for, um... It's been three hours of this. At least we're almost done. Elise is here. Welcome back. How are the depositions, honey? Uh, no, no. Oh, good job, Masubi. Maybe you can recover. No one is moved. No one is moved. No one is moved. No one is moved. Now, Elise and Carl have a beautiful baby named Lexi. Their basement is still full of photo plastered foam core. But just in case, a digital version of John's former office photo gallery lives in my computer. Neither the physical nor the digital versions will be forever. What do have a better chance of surviving are the life lessons John shared with his more than 4,000 students over the years. The sands of time will bury the sores, but Lexi and her children and their children and the children and children's children of so many of John's students will hear the words quid pro quo, scratch your itch, carpe diem, carpe rosum. And some of them will take those words to heart. And they will be, as John's students have been, better off for it. Thank you.